It is a joy for me to introduce to you this evening our new general minister and president, the Reverend Dr. John C. Dorhauer. Thank you for that warm welcome. You're very kind. I do want to do a couple of things before I begin. I, I want to bring some thanks, and I do that the, at the risk of leaving out some folk, but I'm going to do it anyway. First and foremost, uh, the man who has, for about 10 years, been my closest friend and confidant in ministry, Kent Salati. It's a short list of people now that I can share everything I need to share with in order to remain spiritually sound. Uh, Kent is on that short list. I, he's a brother to me. It's one of those moments where you meet somebody, and he said this earlier for the first time, and you know that you are lifelong spiritual companions. Um, and so being here at this time with that man brings great joy to me. I want to thank the inimitable Dave McAllister, with whom I spent a weekend two weeks ago in Kansas, Oklahoma, um, racing go-karts and talking about white privilege. So, <laughs> Where's Chris Davies? Chris? So this is news to all of you. If you were at the presentation this afternoon, you heard me talk about stage one of a strategic plan that the board is undertaking, and that stage one would begin with the deployment of a task force of under 40s to help uh, in the first stage of this strategic planning answer the question, for the United Church to Christ to remain relevant in the next 10 years, what do we need to look like? And I put a short list of people that I wanted to be on that task force and a list of one together that I wanted to chair the task force and my first call was to Chris to ask her if she would chair that and she said yes with enthusiasm and without hesitation so the future of the United Church of Christ rests in your hands Chris I feel pretty good about that so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to start by telling a story about a call, a misdirection, a manipulation, a promise, and a redirection. Then I'm going to talk about a couple of biblical passages that have been foundational for me, all serving as prelude to really what I want to talk to you about, which is the question, why me? And what I'm going to do is answer that question as if the me in the question, we're the United Church of Christ. Why me? Why the United Church of Christ? So we start with the story of my call. I was the second child, but the first of six boys born in succession in a rather large, very strict Catholic household. And from the time of age, you start thinking about what you're going to do when you grow up, I knew I was going to be a priest. Now, I didn't have any doubt about that. When I finally spoke that out loud to my classmates, they laughed in my face. The only F I ever got was an F in conduct. So the thought of, of me going into the priesthood was not something that fit with their image of who I was, but I knew that's what I was called to do. And so it was when I graduated from Catholic grade school, I went immediately into the Catholic seminary right out of grade school and spent the next eight years in the Catholic seminary. And here's what happened over those eight years. Somebody would start teaching to me the doctrine, the canon law, and long before I thought I had the right to question any of that, my curiosity compelled me to ask questions about those teachings. And my experience was, and others have different experiences, but this was mine and it was important, that the questions are not appropriate, that these are the teachings of the church and they have been for 2,000 years. Who are we and who are you to question that? I lived with that for a while. And for a long time I thought, you know what, when I get ordained, I'm going to change that. <laughs> yeah, you get the... 
You get the hilarity in that. As I matured, a couple of things started to dawn on me. One, I wasn't going to change that. And two, a vow of ordination in the Catholic Church would require a vow of obedience, which I was more than willing to offer, but for the fact that that vow of obedience would require me to teach the members of my church to hold fast to those things which I had not yet come to accept as true for myself. And I knew I couldn't do that with integrity. This is where the misdirection comes in. I thought that meant letting go of my call to ministry. That was painful. I was convinced that this was my calling. And I was overcome not just with sadness and grief about letting go of that, but a tremendous sense of guilt that if indeed God had called me to this, then why was I so willing to walk away from that? So after eight years in the seminary, having made the decision not to go on, really what, as I look back on it, could have only been out of a sense of guilt. Within two days of doing that, I went and joined a missionary group, the Marianists. And it, it, it would take me two and a half months to complete all the psychological testing, uh, to go to New York where I would learn Chinese language and Chinese culture, and then be sent overseas to spend the rest of my life as a missionary in China. That was plan B. <laughs> I had no idea there was a plan C. This is where the manipulation comes in. Literally a week after I left the Catholic seminary, and within that week had joined the Marianists as a missionary, my wife served as the maid of honor, this is my wife now 31 years, in my brother's wedding. It turns out my brother would marry my wife's best friend. And she tells me that when I read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at my brother's wedding, that's when she fell in love with me. Now, I'm fresh out of seminary. Eight years in an all-male, celibate, cloistered environment. <laughs> thinking I'm heading to China as a missionary. And a week later, I'm reading that scripture passage. My brother and his wife go off on their honeymoon, and they come back from the honeymoon. I had house sat for them. And they walk in the door and they say, before you go, we need to ask you something. Somebody came to us and wanted to know that now that you're not in the seminary, would you be open to going on a date? I said, okay. <laughs> then they went to Mimi, that's my wife, and said, I'm not going to tell you who, but somebody's asking. <laughs> you see the manipulation part of the story? And so it was that my wife and I went to a Joni Mitchell concert. And afterwards on the parking lot, as I tell the story, what happened is she attacked me. <laughs> now, I'm willing to grant that having spent eight years in a cloistered celibate environment and getting my first kiss, what felt to me like an attack probably wasn't. She certainly overwhelmed me. And I found myself falling in love with this woman and I mean, I spent a summer not at all being able to figure out what in the world was going on in my life. I'm headed to China. How is this happening? And I went to all of my mentors and spiritual directors and elders, and they all said the same thing. John, you've been in an all-male environment for eight years. You're out, you're out one week, you meet somebody, and you're going to throw away your whole pathway. And something inside of me said, it makes no sense, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> and a year later, we were, am I okay here? A year later, we were married. And here's the promise part of this. It wasn't just the vows that we exchanged. Those, of course, were promises. But there was something else we did in that, that wedding ceremony that meant a lot to us, that maybe wasn't fully understood by those who were there. We were very intentional about choosing this passage from Joshua 24 as our wedding verse. 
It reads, it's the 15th verse of the 24th chapter, Choose this day whom you will serve, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And we both were saying right there in front of everybody that our responsibility together is to follow the call of God wherever it leads us. That was the promise. Here comes the redirection. My first test, our first test of that came about three months after our marriage began when I was cooking dinner in, the, in our house for her family who was over for the afternoon when without introduction of any kind, her brother walks into the kitchen, looks me in the eyes and says, just because you're no longer Catholic doesn't mean you're no longer called. Now, I had been scratching my head for about two years wondering what you do with a degree in Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy. (laughs) And really having no idea what was about to be laid out in front of me. But the moment he spoke those words, I went all the way back to my childhood and that sense of call. And I knew, I knew the moment he said that, what would come next. And so they left. I'm laying in bed with my wife that night. I tell her the story and I say, are you willing to go back into seminary with me? Are you willing to let this unfold? She didn't even hesitate. And so it was that now Lutheran, this Catholic, ended up looking all over the place for a seminary that would be consistent with our theology. We were in St. Louis, the home of the St. Louis Cardinals. She was pregnant with our first child. We didn't want to uproot the family. And then I walked onto the campus of Eden Theological Seminary where I met the Dean of Students, David Greenhaw, now president of Eden Theological Seminary. I was working with a painting contractor. That's the answer to the question, who's hiring with a degree in Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy? Paint splatters all over me, staking the high heaven at the end of the day, walking into the seminary, dean of students, and saying, I'd like to come here. His first words to me, John, if you come here, you're going to have to learn to question everything. (laughs) Literally, you had me at hello. (laughs) I knew I was home. And I knew that my pathway had been redirected in ways that I could have never anticipated. The United Church of Christ became our spiritual home. It became what Dick Sparrow would call the church of our heart. Now, I'm going to introduce those two Bible passages to you here, and then I'm going to pursue an answer to the question, why the United Church of Christ? Why us? The first passage was an assignment in my second year of seminary, my first homiletics course, and it was pick one of these eight passages, exegete it, and preach your first trial sermon. One of the passages was Acts chapter 10, verse number 34. And the moment I read the opening line, I knew that that would not only be the passage I would exegete for the class, this would become the passage upon which the entire foundation of my future ministry would be built. The passage reads, it's the opening line to Peter's sermon to Cornelius, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality. I have come to believe, now this is my belief, you know, it carries no more weight than I believe it, that that's the single most important passage in the New Testament. To set the context, the church in that first 10 chapters of the Acts of the Apostles was engaged in its first big battle its first real controversy, the first argument that threatened to tear everything apart, and it of course was the argument about circumcision, and ultimately a question about who's in and who's out and why. And to what extent does adherence to the law govern whether or not you're in or out? And in the one camp you had James and the Jerusalem Council arguing that the law is the law, we will abide by it. 
And in the other camp, you had Paul who was saying things like, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ. And who was actually bringing people into the flock without asking them to be circumcised, preaching even to the Gentiles. And in the middle of all of that was Peter, who is this, it's recorded throughout the Acts of the Apostles, sort of flip-flopped and waffled on this, depending on where he was. But there's no question about where he was when we get to the, the 10th chapter. He had just had this dream about these animals coming from heaven, take, kill, eat. I cannot take, kill, and eat, for these animals are unclean. And then the voice saying, what I tell you is clean, don't you tell me is unclean. Now even that dream is in a context. This is the Peter who had three times failed his test with Jesus on the night Jesus died. I'll never deny you. Before the night's over, three times you'll deny me. I will never deny you. And he did. And I can just imagine in this dream that Peter's thinking he's being tested again. And I'm not going to fail this test. Those animals are not clean. I know it, and I know it because you told me. The narrator doesn't identify the voice that says, what I tell you is clean, don't you tell me is unclean. But we all know whose voice that is. And it's the same voice that convinced Peter by law that they were unclean. Something's going on here. Some new thing is happening. And at the time that the church was invested in this argument, the Holy Spirit was no longer laying away on the sidelines. This was the Holy Spirit's direct intervention in this debate. And saying to Peter, what I tell you is clean, don't you tell me is unclean. He comes out of that dream, three times he has that dream, three times he hears the voice, three times he responds the same way, and three times the voice says, what I tell you is clean, don't you tell me is unclean. He wakes up from the dream, and there's a knock on the door from the servant of Cornelius, will you come and preach to my family, my Gentile family, my uncircumcised family. I got to believe that when Peter said yes to that, he did so with a bit of hesitation and discomfort, but feeling like the dream had something to do with the invitation. And he had some time over a couple of days' journey to the home of Cornelius to work this out in his head. And he declared his voice in this space of conflict when he spoke the opening lines. Truly I perceive now that God shows no partiality. And then an amazing thing happened. The pattern in the Acts of the Apostles, which is repeated over and over and over again, is the apostles preach. The people are moved and converted. They are taken into the waters for baptism, at which point the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Here the pattern breaks. We are told that while Peter was still preaching, before they were baptized and therefore before they were circumcised, the Holy Spirit came even upon the Gentiles, at which point Peter stops his preaching takes the family out to the waters and baptizes them. Chapter 10 closes and chapter 11 opens up where Peter is dragged before the Jerusalem council and James and asked to defend himself. There is, after all, this controversy going on and James has already declared his position on it. Is it true, Peter, that you baptized the Gentiles? Is it true, Peter, that you declared God shows no partiality? Because if you did, we've got a problem. Now, as brilliant as Peter was in interpreting the dream and declaring that God shows no partiality, what he says in his defense in chapter 11 is even more stunningly brilliant. This is Peter at his best. He never got any better than this moment. When Peter says in his defense, hey, I had a dream, I'm preaching, and the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles. If God gave them the same gift God gave us when we believe, then who am I to hinder God? Peter's saying, your problem's not with me. It's with God. And the question for the church in that time and from that time forward has always been, not can you accept the other, but can you accept a God who already has? Which is why the first answer to the question why the United Church of Christ 
is our fundamental belief that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. We have covenanted with one another to reimagine what the church looks like when it's rebuilt and recreated in the image and likeness of a God who shows no partiality. And as the Holy Spirit is looking to birth shalom all over the world, the Holy Spirit will continue to invest herself in a people committed without equivocation or apology to rebuilding a church in that way. And so when we look at the landscape of the future, we know we already know that some of the churches that we have birthed and built for the sake of our mission are going to die and disappear. And we're going to grieve that deeply. But the mission for which this church was built is not disappearing. And when the Holy Spirit asks the question, who? Who is with me in preaching this gospel without apology and without equivocation? It's the United Church of Christ that will stand up first and proudly say, we are here. We will partner with you to build a church recreated in the image and likeness of a God who shows no partiality. The second verse is one we all know. Any of you wearing your UCC emblem can read it right now with me. It's John chapter 20, verse 17, that they may all be one. I've often asked myself, if I were a dying savior, I really haven't af often asked that. <laughs> but when I exegeted this passage, I became curious about that. You know, here Jesus is on the night, his last night on earth, chapter 14 of the God John's Gospel, chapter 15, chapter 16, it's clear he's spending one last moment with his disciples, and those three chapters record all of the things that he tried to teach them knowing he had one last chance with them to get it right. And at the end of that, in the 17th chapter, he stops teaching and he starts praying. This is where I've asked myself, exegeting the text, if I were a dying Savior, what would I pray for? I'm not sure that I would have the wisdom to pray for their unity. But by golly, that's what it takes. And then I asked myself, why? Jesus being the wise one that he is, he knew what would be the essential ingredient without which nobody would take our proclamation seriously. He knew. He knew that if our task was to preach the gospel to all the ends of the earth, proclaiming the power of God's redeeming and transformative love, if in doing that we couldn't demonstrate our love for one another, then who would take us seriously? And how many of us serving our role as evangelists preaching the gospel have heard said to us that you all are a bunch of hypocrites? You talk about love, but you can't love one another. I hear that all the time. And they're not wrong. Jesus knew that the only way this works is for us to find a way to love each other beyond our differences that they may all be one. And so it was in 1957 that these four disparate bodies promised themselves that they would construct a table in such a way that when we got here, none of the differences, none of the controversies, none of the conflicts, None of the disagreements about theology or about politics would keep us from coming to this table as a unified body. And if there's one thing our children and grandchildren already believe, it's in the power of the human community to live as one in shalom with each other. Now, what happened in 1957 was special. And we know that built into our DNA, not just because of what happened in 1957, but because of what happened to us hundreds of years before that, we were the people to answer that call to be one. But it wasn't enough. We are living in a day and in a time when the call to bring the body of Christ together is one 
is a noble calling, but it's not a sufficient calling. The body of Christ, unified, must begin to behave in such a way that it sees itself as a part of a movement that includes other partners, including other interfaith partners. And when the Holy Spirit whose desire it is to reshape human community and the fulfillment of God's vision of shalom, looks out and says, who among us is willing to open their doors and their hearts wide? It is the United Church of Christ built to fulfill that promise that they may all be one that says we're ready for this. A story, I told this story earlier. Last week, Paul Rauschenbusch wrote on the Huffington Post about demonstrations that were scheduled by white supremacists in at least 20 cities exercising their First and Second Amendment rights outside of mosques, temples, and Muslim houses of worship. And at the end of the article, he, he decried the fact that no religious Christian body had yet spoken out about this. And so it was by the end of the afternoon in conversation with my collegian partners, Ben Guest, Jim Mose, and Bentley DeBarta Laban, that we crafted a statement that we immediately sent out to our conference ministers, they immediately sent out to the churches, and within a couple of hours on Facebook, things were already being organized. That went out on Friday. And there were demonstrations of support all over the country. By Monday, the memes that were spreading, quoting that letter, hit over 90,000 hits. And in High Ridge, Missouri, on Sunday morning, a Muslim mother and father with their two children cracked open the front doors of the United Church of Christ in High Ridge, Missouri, a small, rural, all-white church. Imagine you're that couple, and you've never been in a church before, and your experience of Christians is that they condemn you. They beat you with impunity. And something tells you to open that door and walk into that sanctuary, which they did about 10 minutes into the service. Imagine the courage it took not only to open the door, but then to ask the minister if you may speak, which is what they did pastor had the good instincts to stop the service and let them speak. And they talked about a united church of Christ that for the first time stood up and proclaimed its solidarity with the people of the Muslim faith. And all they wanted to say was thank you. They stayed for the worship. They stayed for the fellowship hour afterwards. About a dozen families from the church have reached out to them in the days since and invited them in for dinner, invited them back to worship, asked them how they're doing. This is the United Church of Christ the Holy Spirit is unwilling to invest in. We know this. We've got this. And so when the question is put to us, why us? Well, the Holy Spirit says, because you are the people built to do what makes shalom possible. <laughs> Little did I know as a child growing up that I would one day stand before you, your general minister and president. But I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is. And I know the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which we matter because we will live out our commitment to unify the body and to recreate the church and the world in the image and likeness of a God who shows no partiality. There have been a few surreal moments for me as your general minister and president. One happened about three weeks ago when the Pope was here, and I found myself at the dais in the front of the National Cathedral with the senator, the good senator from Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse to my left, and the ambassador from South Africa on my right. You know that old Sesame Street song, one of these things doesn't belong here? <laughs> I'm still John Dorhour. My first church was a town of, in a town of 220 people, 10 miles from a gallon of gas and a loaf of bread. 
You can't get here from there. <laughs> and then it dawned on me. I'm the general minister and president of one of the most powerful agents of social transformation the world's ever known. We belong. We matter. This is the United Church of Christ. I am proud to call myself your general minister and president. I am proud to lead us in a movement that has the capacity to change the world. And we are going to experience some grief and loss over the next decade or two. Make no mistake about it. But the Holy Spirit is already tilling up the ground in which we will walk and in which our children and grandchildren will walk. And our best days are yet ahead of us. Thank you for listening. If you have questions for Dr. Dor Howard, please proceed to any microphone. Hi. Beautiful presentation. Thank please you. Please state your name and church before your question. Uh, Nancy Baxter, both two churches, Newington and Center Church. Um, let's see. Having been in this denomination all my life, I've lived through many ups and downs with it. Always been very proud of it. Seen a lot of people leave because of it. Mm -hmm. And my deepest concern, as I hear especially us clergy concerned about justice, I hear you concerned about justice, is in fact how we do justice to the people in the pews who are learning where we come from and why we are presenting Jesus in this manner. Um, I think if there's an area that we're really weak in, it's in uh, maintaining the quality of the community. That if we want people to go forward and join us in a wonderful mission, whatever the church is called to, um, I think we need to really work hard at uniting one another in love at the same time. Thank you. Um, a couple of stories, both uh, featuring William Sloan Coffin, one of my heroes. I got the, the opportunity to spend a week with him. He was leading a preaching and teaching for change workshop that I helped organize. And at the end of every day, we would sit in his hotel room and he would sip his vodka and just tell stories. It was <laughs> magical. And two things. One was a story that he told that I'm going to have to edit for this audience. <laughs> he had finished a lecture at New York University where he sometimes taught. And a young woman came up to him afterwards and said, I don't know how you get away with saying what you do from the pulpit. And he looked at her and he said, I get away with it because I'm a bleeping good pastor. <laughs> that taught me a lot about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That it's one thing to be a prophet, it's another thing to be a pastor and be called to a church and to love them. Right where they are. So, halfway through the week, I, I wanted to impress him. I was a young pastor and this is my hero, and so I told a story of my prophetic witness, thinking I would get a little pat on the head and he looked at me with that cup of vodka in his hand, kind of wagged his head a little bit and said, John, true, but not helpful. <laughs> I had to learn how to be a pastor for eight years in a rural community with a prophetic voice. I had to learn again how to be a pastor with a prophetic voice in a small town in the Bible Belt of Lebanon, Missouri. When I finished my interview with the search committee for that church, Hugh Corey, whom I would come to know as the patriarch of the church, looked at me and said, John, you and I are never going to agree on anything. But nobody will fight harder for your right to preach the gospel than I will. And he was right about both things. We would sit in Sunday school after Sunday school after Sunday school together and prove that we wouldn't agree on anything. 
but he truly had the spirit of what it meant to be a part of the body of Christ when he created space for me to be the pastor that I was called to be. And every one of us is a part of a worshiping community that has people of a variety of viewpoints. We're not asked to mitigate our truth or apologize for it. We're asked to present our truth in ways that create space for other truths to also be heard and heard in a way that have the power to affect change within us. And if we do that, we can be what the Spirit is calling us to be. Anything short of that, then we miss the mark. And I can tell you from experience, I've missed the mark more than a few times. But I think I've had the grace to be forgiven at the end of that and, and learn the capacity to be loved beyond that and to be a different kind of person. So, thank you. I don't what, know. When you go into a mic, please speak into the mic. Thank you. Matthew Henry, I'm the senior minister at the Storrs Congregational Church. And my question is not entirely unrelated. I want to... Um, sort of drive at this question of our centering and grounding. Um, you're not the first person in the United Church of Christ in recent years to speak about, um, you know, being a part of a movement that has other partners and, um, and, and the idea of church as movement and not institution. And yet I'm wondering about, uh, as I recall your own quoting uh, at General Synod, of the quote from the former um, NCC president about denominations be, having that vocation of, of uh, holding on to a particular piece that would otherwise be lost. I'm wondering about that even further generalized to the church. When, when I hear a, a lot of language about being part of movement, um, I wonder if we, if we get enough caught up in that that we lose sight of what it is that we have uniquely to offer as church. Um, uh, and even, even, you know, as you use the language of the gospel, what is the gospel, what is the gospel for us? And how are we grounded in that? I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the interview about three or so weeks ago with uh, Nadia Boltz Weber on Fresh Air um, with Terry Gross. And, uh, and uh, where, where Nadia said at her church, they don't talk about activism, social causes, all that, because her people are out there doing that already. They come to her church to hear about sin and salvation, justification and sanctification, the, the font and the table, uh, you know, word and, uh, and Christ, you know. And, and I, I, I just... Um, wonder for us as the United Church of Christ, how do, we, um, how do we move in the direction that you're speaking of while not losing our centering, centeredness in the fact that we are church and not simply a social movement? So it is either true that the teachings of Jesus and the worship of Jesus are pathways enlightened that enable us to enter the world and be a part of the human community with gentility, compassion, and kindness, or it's something else. I happen to believe that that's exactly what that pathway does for me. And if we enter this movement with anything but clarity and pride, about who Jesus is to us were of no use to the movement. And if his teachings and his abiding presence are not there to sustain us in this movement, we are of no use to those who are partnered with us. But what has been too long the case for too many is that Jesus is not presented as our pathway or a pathway but the only legitimate pathway to what we envision as a future shalom. If we become that, we're of no use to the movement. So 
our devotion to the gospel, our passion for the teachings of Jesus, our sustenance of the abiding presence of Jesus through his Holy Spirit is there to sustain us as movement. I, builders may be too strong a word. As participants in a movement that has the capacity to change the world as we know it. Now we're going to encounter along the way those for whom the Tao feeds them in that way and sustains them and opens up their heart and eyes to enter human community safely and compassionately and kindly. And we're going to encounter those for whom the Kabbalist movement is their source of that. And we're going to meet people on the way for whom a simple walk down a mountain pathway is what does it for them. And who aren't sure that any God exists. In their presence, we will claim the legitimacy of our faith. We will testify to the sustenance of our faith. And that will feed us for the journey. But we will be partners with many others on this way. I'm John Madsen Bebo. I'm the interim pastor at Torrington Church. And I need your help with a question. Um, our church has been kind of attached loosely to the denomination. Um, and I did a history of the UCC explaining all the different parts. And at the end of it, a woman said to me, I get it, but if we had it all together as Congregationalists already, what did we get from the UCC? So there's the question. So what I'm about to say is true of the Congregationalists, it's true of the Christians, it's true of the Evangelicals, it's true of the Reformed, it's true of the Methodists, it's true of the Presbyterians, it's true of the United Church, Christ Church. None of us had it all together. And the point at which we imagined we did is the point at which we've compromised our ability to fulfill our missional purpose and calling. And the more we begin to realize that our unity at the table, our unity across the walls of division that separate us is what enables our ability to fulfill our missional calling is the extent to which we will be relevant and credible in the future undertaking of our shared mission. And what the Congregationalists figured out is that those partnerships are essential. It's at the heart of that simple prayer that they may all be one. And as brilliant as the Congregationalists were in creating a way to be church and fulfill the gospel call and the, the missional undertaking, and by the way, I'm a direct descendant of, descendant of John Howland who came over on the Mayflower, though raised Catholic, I am a dyed-in-the-wool Congregationalist. <laughs> as brilliant as they were, they didn't have it all together. There's a passage in Acts that says that they were all together in one place. We can get back to that. Where being congregationalist in the congregational way is an important ingredient without which the body of Christ can't be fully built. But we can look across the aisle and see that the evangelical way is an essential piece of building the body of Christ in such a way that without it, we can't fulfill all that God envisions as possible. It is this undertaking that will make the gospel come alive again in our time, as it did in 1957. And then the other thing that I want to say is, I'm not exactly sure how you phrase that. What does the United Church of Christ have to offer us? There are two responses to that. You are the United Church of Christ. And without you, there is no United Church of Christ. And... I don't know how to say this without coming across as, um, well, I, I'm not as interested in answering the question, what do you have to offer us, as I am the question that Isaiah was asked, how are you called to serve? And it is in wrestling with and discerning that question that the church and the gospel come alive. I hope that doesn't come across as, I don't know, 
arrogant? I'm just passing along the question. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank Fourth you. aisle, first microphone. Thank you. Hi, John. I'm Bob from Rocky Hill Congregational Church. Um, we're coming up on an ugly election season. Can you offer us a pastoral word to sustain us as people of the church? <laughs> so from the days of the Roman Empire and its power over the fledgling way that was the, the church when we knew it in that first generation through this day, from the time of Moses under the hand of the mighty Pharaoh, we have imagined that getting government right determines the successful outcome of our missional endeavors. And yet history teaches us that many more times than not, we're going to get government wrong. And the gospel continues to be preached and lives continue to be changed. Now, I say that knowing, as we all do, that elections matter and that who serves in power has a direct impact on how people live their lives. Um, but I can remember when George W. Bush was elected and one of my brothers said to another one of my brothers, that's the end of America as we know it. Then I remember when Bill Clinton was elected and that brother said to the same other brother, this is the end of America as we know it. We're going to be okay. We're good people. We do good things. And we're going to be okay. Okay. Ready? Okay.